Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And good morning to those who are watching online around the country and around the world. Thank you for being part of this amazing Crossroads family. You know, when you, you think about it, friendship can be and was designed to be one of the greatest parts of our entire life. Abraham Lincoln said this. He said, the better part of one's life consists of his friendship. For those of you that came from a Catholic background, St. Thomas Aquinas said, there is nothing on this earth more to be prized than true friendship. Anonymous said, go ahead, there's Anonymous. That's a, <laughs> he said this, friendship doubles our joy and divides our grief. Ethel Watts Mumford said, God gives us our relatives, but thank God we get to choose our friends. And one friend once told me, said, friends will help you move. Good friends, though, will help you move bodies. So, <laughs> you know, uh, we, we talked last week, we started a series called I Can Relate. And, and we said that we were created for relationship. I mean, the reason God put you on this earth, the reason he made you was for relationship with him and for relationship with other people. Everything else is just gravy on the potatoes. If we're missing those two things, then we're missing what life was supposed to be about. And we said also that it makes us healthier, it makes us stronger as, as, as humans, it makes us stronger as b- believers, it sharpens us, it just blesses us in, uh, in every way. But here's the problem. We live in a culture that, that is, is rough on relationships that it's hard, that there's some things in our culture that, that try to keep us from relationships. One of those is busyness. I mean, if you ask the average person and just say, hey, how you doing, your friend, anything like that, how you doing, what's the answer most of the time? Busy, right? Busy, busy. Oh, man, I've been busy, busy. Oh, I've been busy, busy, busy. And we almost wear it as a, as a badge of, of why, you know, of, of, of why we're on this earth, of just busyness, 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 busyness. Here's the problem. Busyness is the arch enemy of, of relationships, that we can be so busy that we don't have time for relationships because there's only so much of us to go around, right? In fact, we all want relationships. We know that we should have relationships, but we sometimes don't make time for relationships. And if we don't make time for relationships, we won't have time for relationships. Saint Tom, or Aristotle said this, wanting to be friends is quick work, but friendship is a slow ripening fruit. Uh, you know, Mike Iaconelli, who was the head of youth specialties for years before he passed away, he, he wrote this, and he just said, he, he realized that he had no friends, and the primary reason for that was lack of time and busyness. Here's what he wrote. He said, I've come to the startling re- relation a few months ago, I don't have any friends. I don't. I have a lot of acquaintances, but other than my wife, I really have no close friends. I've been wondering why for a long time. And after some painful soul searching, I think I've discovered the reason. I'm too busy. I'm gone too much, I travel too much, I speak too much, I work too much. I've done an excellent job of convincing the people around me that I'm too busy. Too busy doing the important work that I'm doing to have time for friendships. In other words, listen to this, I've convinced them into buying into the myth of my busyness to such a degree that the possibility of my being their friend or their being mine never even enters their mind. And he concludes the article by saying this, if we're too busy to have friends, we're much too busy. I've decided to make new friends. That means I will have to stay home. It means I'll have to spend some time with someone doing absolutely nothing. It will mean I'll have to work at something that's not easy for me. Instead of building a ministry to thousands, maybe we ought to build a friendship with one. Instead of speaking 200 times a year, maybe I ought to be known as someone who knows how to have friends. And can any of us relate? I bet all of us can relate in our our own way, that we live in such a busy culture that sometimes we don't carve out what's most important in life. And if we are too busy to spend time with other people, we're too busy. If we're too too busy to spend time in fellowship with other believers, we're too busy. And if we are too busy to worship God, to spend time with Him every day and throughout a day, then we are far, far, far too, too busy. 
Another thing is isolation. That uh, I remember when e- Elijah, that there was uh, a, a lady, Queen De- Jezebel, wicked lady, and, and she put a contract out on his life, so he hid. I mean, he went, he isolated himself from everything and everybody, and he hid in a cave. Now, you and I may not be, in, you know, in a, a literal cave, but think about how much we have been forced or, or you know, in, encouraged to isolate in the last few years. For a while, we were forced to isolate from people at our school or people at our work or people in society. And for a lot of people that that, that maintained with the fear of getting COVID, that they isolated and continue to, to isolate. And if we're honest, that many of us have gotten out of the habit of being in relationship with other people, at least to the extent of what we we did before. We got out of the habit, and like any habit, it's hard to get back in a habit of a habit we got away from. And sometimes it's easier just to, let's be honest, just to, to not have to worry about getting the kids together and everything like that to make time for worship of the one who we were created to, to, to serve. And, and I thought of this too. It's also, oh, the, the, uh, I love God's response to Elijah. He said this, then he went into, there he went into a cave and he spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? I love this. He said, listen, Elijah, I don't understand why you're here because I didn't create you for isolation. I did not create you to be a caveman. And I really believe that if God were to speak to some of us right now, he would say, what are you doing here? What are you doing in isolation? What are you doing that I did not create you to be a cave man or a cave woman? And we can isolate in different ways, can't we? We can isolate through a, through a TV screen or through a monitor or through, through a, a, a device, right? We can, we can isolate through, through, how about when we drive home and just all of a sudden the garage door goes up, we go in, the garage door go down, we never talk to anybody around us. We can isolate in different ways. And maybe God, through, through me right now, is speaking to you in the same way he spoke to Elijah and saying, it's time to get out of the cave. It's time to, be, uh, to, to get out of isolation. And God told him, he said, he said I want you to, uh, to relate to this person and this person, this person. Gave him specific things of relationships to get out of the, the cave. The other thing is technology. Now, technology can be a wonderful thing, and it can be a wonderful thing even in communication, can it? I mean, I can talk to people around the country. I can talk to people around the world. I can see their face on a, on a screen. I can talk to my friend in, in Kenya, and I can see him, and it doesn't even cost me anything. That's the amazing thing about this, that, that, it can, that technology can be amazing for communication. But can we just be honest and say it's a double-edged sword and it can be rotten for, for real communication as, as well. Let me give you an example that we can probably all relate to. Sometimes there are real flesh and blood people around us and instead of spending time with the real flesh and blood people around us, we are on a device talking to somebody else who's not even, even there. I remember one time when I was with um, doing a, a youth event and the, there was about maybe 10 or 12 youth that were waiting to get on stage and I just happened to look down and look down several times before they were able to come up and every single one of them was on a device. None of them were talking to e- each other. They were either talking to a friend who wasn't there or here's the weird thing, that they were talking to friends who were there but they were texting instead of being face to face with a real live human being. It can be a double-edged sword. And there is a myth that go- is going on right now that's saying that we are communicating better than ever. And that's really, it truly is a myth. Now, we are, we are displaying, you know, showing information more than ever, but we're not relating better than ever before. And what we have is, is we may have a, you know, 5,000 followers on Facebook, and we may have relationships that are mile wide, but let's be honest, most of them are only an inch, an inch deep. They're not really true friends. And here's the thing, uh, too, is, and, and people, people may know what we're having for lunch, and people may know what we're buying, that we just bought some shoes or something like that because we posted it somewhere or anything, but they don't know what makes us tick. They don't may know what makes us laugh, to make us cry, what we love, what we don't love. They don't, they don't know us because, again, our relationships are mile wide and an inch deep. And you think about this, that 80% of communication is nonverbal. 
And that means you got to see the person. You got to be with the person. You got to be, it's, it's their, their uh, that we communicate through body language. We communicate through face expressions. We communicate through how we, how we talk and ups and downs and our, our voice reflection and things like that. And, and it's kind of weird that, that now we have even cartoons. We have emojis to try to explain what we're feeling at the moment instead of just being with a real person and showing them ourselves what we're, what we're really like. Another example, can be this, is that technology can make it where we are relating more with people on a screen, uh, on a TV, on a sitcom or something, than we are with real people. We can be more involved with friends on TV than real friends. Or we can be more involved with the bachelor, bachelorette, and what's going on in their life than we are with the people that we even know and even live with. Something else is, is this. So here's, here's this, is, is I just see that we are not doing friendship well or relationship well in our country right now. So maybe, maybe, maybe we just need to get back to some basics about what, you know, what we, how we can be, make friends and how we can, can even be a good, good friend. And the first thing is, is this, is take the initiative. Take the initiative. Dale Carnegie said this, you can make more friends in two months by becoming really interested in other people than you can in two years by trying to get other people interested in you, which is just another way of saying that the way you make a friend is to be a friend. We reap what we sow, don't we? And, and if you want a friend, be a friend. If you want to have a great friend, then be a great friend to, to somebody else. You know, Jesus is our example for everything. And think about how many times he initiated the friendship. He initiated the friendship with Peter, with Paul. I mean, not Paul, Peter, John. And uh, he he did it also with with Zacchaeus when he said, hey, come down from there. I'm going to have a relationship with, with you. He did it with the woman at the well. He was always initiating relationships. There's somebody in our church that I thought, this couple that said this, I thought it was uh, uh, amazing, the insight that they had. They said, our son is really trying to work on friendships. They don't come easy for him. He's really investing in friendships. I thought, what a perfect word, investing, because that's what we do. We invest in relationship. And what we know is, is investing for investing in anything. You can't get anything out unless you put something in, right? And something else about uh, investments is that you know that not every investment is going to pan out. There's going to be sometimes you invest in a person, you invest in a relationship, and it's not going to pan out the way that you want to. But there's other going to be times that you invest in that relationship, and it's going to be greater than you ever dreamed or imagined. Another thing, not only do we take the initiative, we also take, take time. That uh, something you know, if anybody that's ever done gardening in any way, you know that the, the plants you water are going to, they're going to grow. If you don't water a plant, it's going to not grow. And not only is it not going to grow, it is going to wither and die after a while. And we know the same thing is true in relationships. That there are people that you used to be close to that you're not close to anymore. And it's not because you stopped liking the person or they stopped liking you. It's simply because you stopped or they stopped or together stopped watering that relationship. On the other hand, there are some people that you're very close to now that you weren't close to very long ago. And the reason is you're watering that relationship. They're watering that relationship. And because of that, it's, it's growing. Another thing is be cheerful. Be cheerful. Smile. This may sound like a little thing and that may sound like a no-brainer, but it is a huge thing. Think of it. We can, you can instantaneously connect with another human being just by smiling at them, right? I mean, you smile and then they smile at you. All of a sudden, you've got a connection there. A romance can start just by simply smiling at, a, at another person. You can change the environment of, of your, your office. You can change the environment of a, of a school. You can change the environment of your home with just smiling. Can you imagine how different life would be just at the home if you just started smiling to your spouse or smiling to your kids, smiling to your parents and things, and just there was a, an environment of smiles? And think of it, you can change somebody's day. Somebody can change your day just by a smile. They can be having a horrible, horrible day and you just smile at the waitress and, and, and all of a sudden something, something happens, something clicks. Another thing is, is a smile is universal. 
It's one of the few things that is. Language is not universal. You go to different parts of the world, language is completely different. But you can, a smile is the same everywhere, isn't it? I mean, I don't care where you travel in the world. I've traveled around the world, and a smile means the same thing everywhere. A smile mean, you know, is, is a great way to break down anything with, uh, anything with anybody. And you know, I've been to, I'll give you an example of this. I've been to other countries, and one time I was in, in, in Kenya doing a mission work there, and we were in the northern part of, uh, of Kenya near the Sudan border, I guess it's the South Sudan border, and, and so uh, there were some people there, the tribesmen that we were working with, and in, unless we had a translator, we couldn't communicate with them at all because they did not know a word of English, and we did not know a word of Chicana. But I remember uh, going to eat the, uh, one time, and I just had some, some food, and and I, I saw these guys, and I just smiled. And what do you think they did? They smiled back. And so instantaneous, we don't speak the same language, and suddenly we're friends, and we, don't even, we, don't, we can't even communicate with each other that way, but a smile has broken down any barrier like that. And I remember also eating it and, and, and looking and looking at them and, and doing like this and smiling, and they smile back. And again, we have a relationship, everything. Hey, the food's great. We know that, what, through a, through a smile. And I remember that, that trip. There was a, a girl that's probably in her, her younger 20s uh, that was from California on that same trip, and, and she was fearless. I mean, this girl had, had no fear. In fact, she tried to get a rogue elephant to charge us one time. I mean, she tries to get it upset at us and tries to, to do this. But this same girl was terrified of bugs. And there were a lot of bugs there, okay? So what we'd intentionally do, well, I'll tell you what I did one time, okay? So all of a sudden, this bug just flies out of nowhere and lands right in front of my plate. And I mean, it's huge. It's one of the biggest insects I've ever seen. Anything that flies this big should have in-flight movies and beverage service, okay? I mean, it's huge and goes there. So I, 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 look, at the, I, I look at it, and the girl is about, about where the front row is over, over there, okay? And so I look at this, and I look at her, and I go, and the guys go. <sighs> guys are the same in any country, okay? And so the thought of me, you know, even coming close, throwing a bug that big, you know, that big, what are the chances of me getting near the person? That's not very good, right? But I chuck it at her. Not only does it get near her, it hits her. And not only does it hit her, it hits the back of her head and goes right down her dress. You're bad. <laughs> so, this is confession time. This is confession. So, you know, so at this point now, there's not just smiles on our face. Every guy there is laughing their head off. We are waiting for a scream to come out that never does. Apparently, it just went straight down and just went, just, it never, she was never aware that it ever happened. But all of a sudden, man, we were close, these guys and I, that anytime we'd see each other again, just a smile connected us once, uh, once again with, uh, with all that. Smiles are also contagious. You know that. I mean, if you smile at somebody, what are they usually going to do? Not always, but what are they usually going to do? They're going to smile back, right? And also, a smiles are, a smiling is easy. It takes only seven muscles in your face to, to smile. It takes 42 to frown. In other words, smiling is seven times easier than, six times easier than, uh, than, than frowning. And it's a whole whole lot more fun for you and for everybody else around, isn't it? Smiling is also attractive. Studies will show that you immediately become more attractive if you, if you smile. You are cuter the moment you smile. And you think about that, maybe we should spend less time worrying about how we look in our, our, our jeans or how, our, how big our pecs or how big our, our biceps are, and we worry more about what is going on on our face. I love to talk and ask people, you know, how they got together and how they, you know, where, they, where the romance first started. And so many times, so many times, I bet it's over half the time, the person will say, the guy will say, I saw her smile. Or the girl will say, it's, her, it's his smile that attracted me to, to him. A smile can be an incredible thing in, uh, for, for even attraction. A smile is also a good witness. I, don't, I, I do not like that when, when sometimes the Christian, I know we go through tough times and everything. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking a, a Christian who ha, should have the joy of the Lord inside of them and they look like they've been baptized in vinegar. You know, you know what I'm talking about. And, and, and we should be, I mean, how many of you, let me ask this question. How many of you are absolutely thrilled that you are saved and going to heaven when you die? I mean, th and think, is that not true? Absolutely. And so think about this. Let your face know about it, right? 
it's a great witness. When, I remember one time being uh, up in the mountains in Asheville with some, with some friends from the church, and, uh, and we were cutting up and just having a great time. And a lady comes up and she says, you guys are the most joyful people I've ever seen in my life. What is your secret? And I said, well, if you really want to know, we're Christians and we've got the joy of the Lord inside of us. Now, it's funny because I think I could have said anything else. I could have said, we get a colon cleanse once a week. That's why we're so happy. <laughs> or I think I could say, you know, that, uh, you know, that I, we follow this one guru, but it's really weird. Up there for whatever reason, that lady was, oh. You know, we said Jesus and suddenly she wasn't interested in the very answer to the question that she, that she asked. But other, other things, smiling is healthy. It's just, it's, it's good for us. Proverbs 15.30 says, a cheerful look brings joy to the heart. Now, you would think it says the opposite. And we know the opposite is true. Usually a joyful heart brings, brings a smile on our face. But, but studies will show that also the opposite is true. That if we smile, we can be in a bad mood. And if we smile, do something outside physically, that it does something internally to our heart and our joy as, uh, as, as well. Uh, another thing is just be nice. Be nice. I don't know if you've just, maybe it's just me, but it just seems like people are getting crankier and crankier, you know, through the, through the years. And it seems like people are getting meaner in what they say. But, but here's the thing that, that we know is nobody likes to hang around a cranky person or a mean person. It's like the, the guy that was just the, the jerk came up to the, a florist, and he's just mad, and he goes, you idiots, you guys blew it so bad. And he said, sir, what did, uh, the florist said, what did, what did we do? And he said, I wanted a bouquet for a housewarming for a friend, and we got a bouquet that said, rest in peace. And he's, the florist said, well, it could be worse. He said, how could it be worse? He said, right now, there's a cemetery going on that has a, a bouquet next to a casket that says, hope you enjoy your new home. <laughs> the Bible says in Proverbs 15, the Lord is pleased with friendly words. The Bible also says in Proverbs 16, kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. Proverbs 15 again says this, a different one says, kind words help heal and help, cutting words wound and maim. And which would you rather hang out with, people whose words wound and maim or people whose words are giving healing and are helpful? So would everybody else. And another thing is be yourself. Just be yourself in a relationship. And somebody may say, well, you know, if I'm really myself, I don't know if that person will like me. If they don't like you, if you're yourself, then they're not your real friend right? And they're never going to be a real friend. If you have to pretend to be somebody else to have that person at school or have that person at work like you or become popular or anything like that, man, it's not worth it. And, and they're never going to be your real friend. Uh, I, I love how uh, the Bible puts it in 2 Corinthians. It says, Paul's saying this, we refuse to wear masks and play games and we don't maneuver and we don't manipulate behind the, behind the scenes. He, he's saying, I refuse to pretend we refuse to pretend to be something that I'm not, to put on a facade just to impress somebody, somebody else. And I, I you know, I, I have to confess another time that I did something one time. That I was at, uh, I was in, in high school. I was 16 years old and I was studying with, uh, with three girls at the, at the library. And we came out after we'd studied for, for several hours in there and, and they went to, to their car and I saw them, but I, my car was a little further down. And next to my parents' car, okay, which is what I was driving, was a brand spanking new shiny red Corvette. So I just, I thought, I'm just gonna do something fun here. And I did this to play, you know, just to play around. But as they're about to drive by, I thought I can either, I, so I took my keys and I went over to the Corvette and I pretended like I was doing this and I wave at the girls as they go by here. Well, and they're really waving at this point. And they say, and so, but the, the point is the next day, guess what happened? All these people come up to me and say, man, I, I want to ride in your Corvette. I want to ride in your Corvette. And I thought, I got to tell these girls what went on. And I was just playing around because wouldn't they be surprised if I asked one of them out and I drive up in a 1973 digestive enzyme green Dodge Cornet instead of a Chevy Corvette, right? 
And so sometimes, and here's the thing, sometimes we can pretend to be somebody that we're not. In fact, there's a whole thing on that. It's called catfishing. And you, you pretend like you're somebody else to attract somebody else or to impress somebody else. And we even, you, people do that on dating sites and they pretend to be something or somebody that they're, that they're, they're not. And I, I always wondered about this because I always thought how stupid that is, that if things go as you want them to go, then that person is going to get to know you better and they're going to know that you're, you know, whatever, not the crown prince of Monaco or whatever you put down there and things. And so, and so why not just be honest at the start? Otherwise, your relationship is based on, uh, on a lie and just be yourself. But here's the thing too. You have to love yourself uh, in order to love anybody else. You can't love anybody else and truly, until you truly love yourself. The second greatest commandment is love your neighbor. How? As you love yourself. And you can't really love your neighbor if you don't love yourself. And here's the point. If I don't feel good about me, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you down and I'm going to, I'm going to throw shade on you and I'm going to ridicule you and I'm going to backbite you and I'm going to do, I'm going to do all that stuff. Why? Because if, if I don't feel good about me, I'm going to make darn sure that you don't feel good about you either. And here's the point that, that me, that, that, that hurt people hurt people. So if you're at school and somebody's dissing you and somebody's putting you down and somebody's nitpick, or, if, or maybe in your, you know, you're an in-law or maybe it's your spouse or maybe it's somebody in your family or maybe it's just somebody you work with and they're always dissing other people or they're dissing you, it says a lot more about them than, than, than that. It's saying that they don't like themselves because again, hurt people will always hurt people. Um, and so again, here's the thing too. God made you exactly the way he wants you to be. He loves how he made you. you. You've got something going for you that nobody else does. And that's only you can be you. Only you can truly be you. You're the best you that, that they'll ever be on this planet. You're, you're gonna be the best you that anybody, that they'll ever be on this, on this planet. God made you special. You are, according to the Bible, God's workmanship, God's masterpiece, another translation says. And think about this. So, so you know what you can be? Just be yourself. If people don't like that, that's, that's tough on, on them. If they can't hack it, get their jacket, right? And so just be, be you, and it's a whole lot more fun. It's a whole lot more authentic. Another thing is be conversational. That means get to know the other person. Ask, and the way you get to know another person is ask the other person questions. Listen to Philippians says this. Don't just think about your own affairs, but be interested in others and in what they are doing. So you want to you wanna gain friends? Don't just be interesting. Be interested. And I want to say that quote again. He said, you can make more friends in two months by becoming really interested in another person than you can in two years by trying to get other people interested in you. If we just worked hard on being interested as we do of trying to be interesting, men, people would come out of the woodworks to be our friend because this is a world that is crying, dying, and sighing. They want people to just be interested in them in a world that seems to be interested in everything else. Proverbs 20 verse 5 says this, a person's thoughts are like water in a deep well, but the, with insight, you can draw them out. How do you draw them out? You draw them out with questions. And you may say, well, I'm not really good at that. I'm not good at, 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 at asking questions. I bet you can become at least better at that because if, you, if there's people that you know that are good at that, watch how they do it and watch how they draw other people out with, with questions. There's actually questions online that are sometimes that are great questions to just get to know somebody, to get to know somebody, somebody better. You can ask them a question. And the best way is just listen. As you listen to somebody, as they're talking about their life, you can ask them other questions about their life. And they realize twice that you're not only interested enough to hear them, but you're interested enough to ask another question about them as, uh, as, as well. And this is, this is not an extrovert-introvert thing. Because uh, you and I know, we know extroverts that aren't good at, uh, at, at really communication with other, with other people. They're not good at, at being interested in other people and the, and, or asking questions. And then there's other people who are introverts who are phenomenal at conversations. They're phenomenal at, at that, at asking questions because they really, they really listen. It's not one or the other. So be interested in, in other people and be the type of friend that you'd like to have. The, the golden rule is this. 
Do unto others whatever you would want them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. Jesus says, says this, that, that, uh, that treat other people the way you'd want to be treated. I mean, that makes life simple. And don't treat people in a way that you would not like to be treated. How does this relate to friendship? Treat people the way you'd like to be treated and don't treat them the way they would, you wouldn't want to be treated. And man, the friendships will, friendships will, will grow. Because here's the, the thing too, is you will attract who you are, not just who you want to attract. You will attract who you are. If you are a shallow person, you'll attract shallow, shallow friends. If you are a, a, a bitter person, or a gossip, you will attract those kind of people. If you're a, 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 a happy person and a person who likes to laugh, you'll attract other people who like to, to, to laugh. If you're a godly person, you'll attract godly friends. If you are a rebel, you will attract rebels. Whoever you are is what you will attract. So maybe how you look around, look at who you're attracting in there. But here's the, here's the thing. If um, be the friend you'd want to be, you'd want others to, to be to, to you, uh, be the boyfriend. Be the girlfriend that you would want if you were in their, their shoes. Be, the, uh, be the, the spouse that you would want. If you're a teenager in here or a, or a, uh, a youth in, in here, there's probably going to be a day, most likely, that you're going to have kids of your own. Be the type of kid that you would want your kids to be with you. That's the golden, that's the golden rule. And just want to close with, with this, some questions. Maybe if we could just even bow our head and ask these questions. Have you been too busy for relationships? If you've been too busy for those, then you've been too busy. What are we going to do? What are you going to do to make more time for relationship? Have you been isolating yourself? Have you been isolating yourself as an individual or as a couple or even as a family? And God is saying, it's time to come out of the cave. Is technology hurt, hurting real relationships with flesh and blood people? And if so, what are you going to do about it? What are some changes you can make to be proactive about being more engaged with the people that are with you, not just people that are online? And here's the things. Take the initiative to be a friend. Take the time for friendship. Be cheerful. Be nice. Be yourself. Be conversational and be the type of friend that you'd like to have. God, we thank you that you are the greatest friend that will never leave us or forsake us. Thank you, Lord God, that you know everything about friendship and you talk so much in your word about it. So help us be good friends. Help us, God. I pray for those people right now who are, are lonely and feeling alone. And God, I pray that you bring friendships into their, their life. Bring connection, God, in, the, in this body and other places, Lord God, in their life. Bring connection into them. Bring even a good, close friend that they can have. And Lord God, thank you that we have each other. Thank you that we have our brothers and sisters uh, in you, Lord God, that can encourage in, in this and help us be the kind of friend that we would want to have. And all God's people says, amen. Oh,